How's everyone doing this morning? Come on, how are you doing this morning? Come on. Did you forget what I spoke on last week? Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is fullness of joy. Joy that is overflowing, amen? You can't convince me that you're not walking in the Spirit when there's no joy around your life. The evidence of the Spirit is you, there's joy. You laugh a lot. You, don't, you, you laugh more than you frown. You encourage more than you complain. <laughs> Hello? God's very, very happy. The Holy Spirit is very, very happy. And uh, the, like I said, the evidence of the Holy Spirit working in our life, the evidence of our relationship with the Holy Spirit is that there is joy that overflows out of our life. Amen? Yeah. We've got to be the most happiest people. And the, like I preached on last Sunday, the joy that we have is not circumstantial. It is based on a relationship. It is based on the relationship. It is based on the relationship with the person that overcame the world and everything that the world had to throw at him. And he is risen again. And because I have relationship with him, there's nothing really that can really bother me except what I give permission for. Hello. I'm excited about what God has done. I'm excited about what God is doing. And I'm excited about what he is working on for us right now. I want to just pick up where I, uh, where I started off last week. Uh, the word joy means uh, sim, shim, sim, simcha or simkao, however you want to pronounce it. And uh, I brought it out of uh, Deuteronomy chapter 12. And the word sim, simcha simply mean, it means, to a very small degree, joy. So if, if, you, if you think about the language of this, there is no English word that can fully describe what the word shimka, shim, simcha actually means. And when, you look at, when we looked at uh, Deuteronomy last week, one of the things it says, it says, make time to celebrate, make time to uh, have joyful occasions in your life, make time to express joy in their life. But one of the big things he says is don't do it alone. Never do it alone. Invite people for a party. Invite the music team. Invite the strangers. Invite the widows. Invite people that are different to you. In other words, he's saying this. He's saying uh, the word sh- sim- simcha or joy, it means joy that is shared. It's very, very important that we understand that it's not just a selfie joy, that it is a, a joy that is shared. And there's a very big reason why joy should be shared. If you're just going to have a little party by yourself and enjoy the good pleasures that you have, in your, what happens is you... We, we become into a very real danger of losing and forgetting why we have that joy in the first place. And the, so the reason, the, the meaning behind that is that it's shared joy is because that there is a, when we share the joy, when we share with people that are maybe different to us, that are maybe not in the same position as us, or when we, when we make a decision to uh, share the joy, in other words, that the joy would overflow into the people around us, it reminds us where that joy came from. Hello. It reminds us where that joy came from. And there's another interesting reason why I believe this. There's a reason why, because this. Moses foresaw, understand this. When Moses wrote this, it is is at the end of his life. So it is about the last year of his life that Moses actually writes this. So in other words, he is reflecting back on the journey of the Israelite people. He's reflecting back on his time in Egypt. He was reflecting back on the whole journey of of his people, bringing the people out, bringing the people uh, through the desert and right inside of the promised land. And he knows what's ahead of them. He's not going to walk in them in there himself, but he knows what's ahead of them. So one of the things he's talking about is he is preparing people's lives for their future. Basically what he's saying is this, your greatest challenge as a nation or your greatest challenge as a people is not going to be the wandering through the desert. Often we think it's the wandering through the desert and that the trials and the hostilities that make us great. Yes, they do. Anyone can be great in times of hostility. What he's talking about, though, is this. When he's reminding people to share the joy, in other words, to remember the people there around him. In other words, he's saying this. He said that he's, Moses foresaw the future, that the hardest part or the most challenging part of the future was not the hostilities, but the joy of contentment. That is the joy of contentment. It's amazing how people quickly forget. When life is going tough, people's prayers are kind of different. (laughs) 
but when we're coming to a place of contentment, when we have everything, Moses foresaw actually the main challenge that they're going to have is being able to retain their promises in their new home. Because the hostilities have kind of moved past, they'll still have some challenges, but the greatest things will be the blessing that they receive and start to walk in, and then they start to forget about where, those, where that blessing came from. You've got to understand that we live in a very, very beautiful country. We live in a place where, sure, there's some, certainly some challenges, but nowhere near and compare to some of the challenges that I know many people have. When I was living in Pakistan, some of the challenges that people were having here, when I commended, when I thought about the challenges that many people struggle with here, I thought people would give their right arm to experience the challenges that I'm having today. <laughs> You think about Apostle Tamara and his ministry. People lining up 24 hours beforehand, before the church starts, because if they don't do that, they will not even get a seat in the overflow room. Think about that. The, th the issue is that we are, as much as we do have some challenges in our country, we are largely blessed. We are largely blessed. Blessed beyond what we can ever imagine. It is easy to speak to God in tears, but it is harder to serve God in joy. You think about the 10 lepers, for example. That story was a story that's specifically placed in the scripture where there were 10 lepers that came along. They implored Jesus that he would be healed. Jesus healed them, but one came back. What's the point of that story? When people are struggling, it's, oh, Jesus, pastor, help me, help me, help me. But once the problem solved, oh, Jesus who? <laughs> Once they cleanse, it's like, hello, hey, hey. And Jesus said, uh, wasn't there, wasn't there 10 of you all? Yeah. Where'd you all go to? One came back. Shared joy is a reminder of where we were, what the Lord has done and what he would do. I want to open up the scripture in, in, in Deuteronomy chapter 8 again. You can read through this whole chapter, but I'm, it's, it's not very long, but I'm just going to open up a, a, just a few scriptures here for you. We're going to start in verse 6. Therefore, you shall keep the commandments of the Lord your God, or in other words, you shall remember. Somebody say remember. You shall remember the commandments of the Lord your God to walk in His ways and to fear Him. For the Lord your God is bringing you into a good land, a land of brooks of water, of fountains and springs that will flow out of valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley and of vines and fig trees and pomegranates, the land of olive oil and honey, a land in which you will eat bread without scarcity. That is, it's gluten-free bread he's talking about. Yeah just in case for the gluten intolerant people. <laughs> in which you will lack nothing. Somebody say, we will, we will lack nothing. Lack nothing. A land whose stones are of iron and out of the hills you can dig copper. In verse 10, when you have eaten and are full, then you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which he has given you. And then it changes. That You notice the scripture starts to change here. The wording starts to change. In verse 11, Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by keeping his commandments, his judgments, and his statutes, which I charge you today. Least when you have eaten and are full, and you have built yourself some beautiful houses and live in them, when your herds and your flocks multiply, and your silver and... Oh, come on, this is the church. This is the future that God has called us to. When your silver and your gold are multiplied, when your shares have gone up, when your house has increased in value, when you've got a pay rise, when all of a sudden you've got a contract that's worth multi-millions of dollars, all of a sudden, when your heart is lifted up, you forget the Lord, your God, that you brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, who led you through that path, brought you through those Bibles, brought you through that training school, brought you to church, brought you there, brought you through the place, and you know, you know where the Lord brought you from in which you were fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty land where there was no water, who brought you water out for you out of the rock, who fed you in the wilderness with manna, which your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and he would test you, that you to do good to the end. In other words, he's saying, there's two, two words basically he's saying. He says, remember, to remember and to forget. Remember and to forget. And the core verse of this, and right in the middle, was this. 
that when you have eaten and are full, you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land that he has given you. Two concepts here, remembering and forgetting. It's about memory. Somebody say memory. Memory. Interesting that the two verses flow one from the other. And the the whole passage of Scripture starts off about remembering, and then it says don't forget. Remember this, don't forget that. Remember this, don't forget that. It goes on to say, good things, basically saying this, good things are going to happen to you. And it's God's plan to bless you and to bring you into a good place. However, he, he implies this, everything will depend on how you respond when you are in that good place. People often enter into a good place and when they forget where it came from, all of a sudden they find themselves in a bad place again. So either you will eat and be satisfied and bless the Lord, remembering that all things come from Him, or you will eat and be satisfied and forget to whom gave you all this. You'll think it comes from your own strong hands or your own spiritual enlightenment. (laughs) Moses simply says this, he implies this, all this may seem a small difference, but it will make all the difference. This alone will turn your future as a nation in its own land. In other words, The whole idea of what to remember, what not to remember, what to forget, what not to forget, is a big shaper of our lives and a big shaper of our future. It's not necessarily the great spiritual encounters that we have, but it's our memory, what we retain in our our inner self, what we choose to remember, what we choose to forget. Our life is largely shaped shaped to a large degree by what we remember. So people can be strong in times of crisis, but when the war is over, memory starts to fade and people lose sight of the valleys they once fought for and eventually internal decay starts to get inside of the heart. You can see that in our nation right now on a national sense. We are a very blessed nation because of what people have bought in in certain ways. However, what happens is when people start to lose the values in which the nation was built on and became prosperous, all of a sudden, the decay starts to set in. The same thing can happen with any person, pastors, prophets, whatever. It doesn't really matter how spiritual you are or think you are. It matters. It doesn't matter. The, the, what matters is what really what we remember, what we choose to remember, and what we also choose to forget. Are you with me this morning? Let me let me explain. What is memory for me? I, look, I just put down a few thoughts here for you today. But for me, I'm going to be. I'm working through this myself. Memory is the library of thoughts, words, knowledge, actions, and experiences that we retain inside of us. It's what we are conscious of, but it's also what we are not conscious of, but still present and shape our lives. Let me explain this. If you were to look at this room, you, this room, look at all the people out here. If you, if you could consider that everyone This is like our heart. This is like our internal life. That there are people on the front row, there are people on the next row, and there are people all the way rows back. This is very much like our memory. There are memories, there are thoughts that are on the front row of our life that are obvious, they're right there. We're conscious of them, we're aware of them. But then there are memories that are further back. They may be not clearly visible. Sometimes they're not visible at all. But nonetheless, they are still present and their presence matter and has an effect in our life. People's words, people's actions, people's experiences. Time doesn't necessarily make things go away. What it does, it just puts things into a back back seat and their effect is still inside of our life. It's what we are conscious of, but it still presents and shape our life. There are things in our memory banks that we're not necessarily conscious of, but yet they still shape our life. They shape our decisions. They shape what we think about things. They shape what goes on in our heart. The Bible speaks a lot about memory. In fact, if you looked, if you did a Bible search, you'd find that all through the Bible it says, remember this, forget that. Remember this, remember the Lord your God. Remember the Lord your God in the day of the youth. There's a big reason why, because it affects our life. There's also um, the opposite of that. 
is what not to remember and what not to forget. Sometimes we get the things mixed around. We remember the things that we should be forgetting. And we forget the things that we should remember. Like a fence. Often, when we're offended or something negative happens, instead of being, instead of forgetting it, or instead of, I prayed my prayer of repentance, I said sorry and all that sort of stuff, but actually it's still in the front row of my life. <laughs> the Lord says in the scripture, he said, as far as the east is from the west, that's how far he has removed our transgressions from us. When we repent and change our heart, actually the Lord wipes that off the scope of our heart. Yet, in the very same breath, we would keep the things that other people do to us and keep them close to our heart or keep, them, uh, keep, uh, keep an awareness of them in our mind. We remember the things that we should forget and we forget the things that we should remember. Hello. There are things that have been set in stone. When you think about the, God, the Lord's commandments, there are things that the Lord has set in stone for all eternity. But there are things that can be erased, essentially. Essentially, memory is a precious gift that plays a big part in how we live our lives. It transforms moments of our lives and events in history into a narrative or our life story. In other words, our memory bank, what we retain inside of our life, sets the course. It becomes the story that we tell. And it, it, it sets our future, and it also tells the story of our past. It's very, very easy to tell somebody's future without getting too prophetic, by simply listening to the story that they retain and speak out of their mouth. Because the Bible says, out of the heart, the mouth speaks. So in other words, whatever has been stored and remains on the front line of our memory of our, of our memory banks, it will come out of our mouth. It will come out in the way that we express somehow, somewhere. So it's very, very easy to tell to a large degree where somebody's life is tracking to by simply listening to the story that their life tells. In other words, what are they remembering? What are they forgetting? Does that make sense? There are sometimes people tell a narrative and you can hear it, a, a narrative of poverty. When, people, when, 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 we, when you hear the narrative of poverty that comes out of a person's mouth, you can tell unless there is a significant intervention, you will find that their whole life in front of them will be struggling with poverty. That will be the narrative of their life. When some people, when you hear bitter talk come out of people's mouths, you can tell somewhere inside of their memory they are holding on to a, bit, a root of bitterness and eventually they'll have some great experiences. But the narrative of their life would be that of, of injustice or bitterness. So all, a, large, a large amount depends on what we retain inside of, our, um, inside of our life. It becomes the story that we tell as a nation. It becomes the story that we tell as a family. It becomes the story we tell as a church and as individuals based on the memory. A couple of thoughts here. There are different types of memory. One is muscle memory. For example, uh, for, uh, for, for musicians and athletes and people like that, one of the things that they, what they do is they, part of practicing is that you develop muscle memory. You don't just develop me muscle memory by one shot on the instrument. One of the ways that you get good at being on your instrument or being good at your profession is by muscle memory. You repeat doing the same thing and keep better and better and better until the point where it's so embedded in your muscle memory that you can get on and do something without thinking. I haven't played the drums probably for a long time, but I could get on there and I could do something because I played them multiple times, day in, day out, day in. I could get on and can do the same thing. And with a little bit of practice, I could get just as good as I used to be. But I could still do it because it's built into my muscle memory because I repeated it time and time again the same thing will happen with things like injustice the same thing will happen with poverty the same thing will happen with what you hold on to your heart when you give it time when you give it your, when you give it when you feed it it will become prominent in your life and it will start to develop as a memory and you will start doing it without thinking some people speak bitterly without even thinking about it because they have given their mind to dwell on it and it's become so part of their life it's become culturally normal for them and it's the same thing about poverty, and it's the same thing about prosperity. Whatever we feed, whatever we discipline, whatever we repeat in our life will become a memory. There's a muscle memory that you can have. 
There's also a mental memory, which is intellect. I don't know if you know your five, five times tables or your, you know, some people can rattle off the times tables just like that. Why? Because it is embedded into their memory. They can do it without thinking about it. Part of, uh, part of education was to, is, to, is to shape your thinking as, and is to help develop your intellect. So there are things that you can learn intellectually that you can do without thinking because you've repeated them enough times inside of your head that, that it's become a memory and that the memory is not, just a, uh, it's not just a distant memory, it is a strong memory. Do you know what I'm saying? It is on the front row of our consciousness. We can do it without thinking about it. There are things that people here can do. You can do it without thinking about it because it is in your memory. It is stored in your memory banks. There are, and let, let me explain this. There's also a heart memory which affects the why we do or do not do some things. So we have a muscle memory. We have a, 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 a mental memory, but we also have a, a heart memory. So our heart memory is where is really what shapes the why we do and what we don't do, what we give our life to, what we don't give our life to. It, is the, it establishes the why of our memory. The heart has a memory. And there's a very, very big reason why we do or do not do something. There's a big thing is this. One, because memory or heart memory always has attachments to it. Memory of the heart has attachments to it. Let me explain. The first, the first attachment is this, is when, when there is a heart memory, there is always an emotion or feelings attached to that memory. In other words, when, when you are reminded of something that you think you have forgotten, all of a sudden you'll discover that there is a, an emotion or a feeling that comes to that. Does that make sense? So if you've... If you remember the day you got married, or you remember your first kiss, or you remember this, or you remember that, if you, when you remember it, you feel something inside of it. When you give your attention to what you remember, when you bring that memory from the back seat to the front seat, you'll find that there is an emotion attached to it. Does that make sense? Is that clear? You'll find that is also the same thing with pain, where there's been pain in people's lives. There's a, a, there's a feeling attached to that pain. Just because it's in the back seat doesn't necessarily mean it's not there, and it doesn't affect your life. So there is emotions that are attached to it, and many people make their decisions based on what they feel. Hello? Many people make their decisions in life based on what they feel. If I feel like coming to church, then I'll come to church. If I don't feel like coming to church, I won't come to church. That is not, that is not the best way of making your decisions, because... Actually, emotions are fickle. But actually, where there's a memory, there's always an attachment to it. There's all, the, uh, the, the second thing that is attached to it is an action. In other words, whenever we have a, a, a memory of something, there is an emotion attached to it, but there's also an action or a reaction or response. In other words, when we are reminded or when we have something in our memory that is in the front of us, one, we feel something about it, and two, there's an, there's an action that's associated. Either we respond to it, or we withhold or we withdraw to it from it. For example, if there is a, uh, a memory of pain that surfaces in our life because of something, one, we'll feel, you'll, you'll feel something about that. And then that feeling will, will cause you to, or influence you to respond, either withdrawing or moving forward. Uh, and I'll unpack this just a little bit for you. So whether it's, we're conscious of it or subconscious, it shapes what we choose to do or don't do, what we give ourselves to or what we withhold. In other words, let me explain this. Like boldness and confidence are also connected to memory. If I have done something a thousand times, I've got good at it, it gives me confidence. In other words, if I got asked to preach in front of a group of people, because I know what to do, I've done it a hundred times, I'm kind of okay at it, I'll be confident enough to do it. I'm not going to freak out, and I'll be boldness. My action or my response to it will be forthcoming. But the same thing was, the same thing was with fear. When we uh, have had experiences where we are be, have been afraid or that have tormented us, whenever we have an experience like that again, what happens is you'll feel the pain of it, or you'll feel the fear of it, and then there'll be a, a, an action with it that you'll withdraw. Our whole life is shaped by this. I've been 
for me, one of the big things I've been doing over this last two years or so is I've been looking at my responses and becoming more aware of when I push myself forward or when I withdraw. And I've got to ask myself, what am I feeling when I'm withdrawing and what, is that, what memory is that feeling attached to? Does that make sense? And if it's in a negative context, then I can't just pretend it's not there because it's not just going to go away by itself. It needs an intervention. And one of the third things that you'll find is that attached to memory is spirits because spirits get attached to our memory. And, it's, and, and, and that's where the sting can often come in our life. So the only way that we can actually get rid of those spirits and their memories is allowing the Holy Spirit to come in and help us. It's not going to go away by itself. We have to allow somebody to touch our life. There's a way that we can... So, so, so memories don't just go. National memories don't just go. Family memories don't just go. Individual memories, they don't just go by themselves. Just because they're hiding in the back row doesn't mean that they're not there and they don't affect our life. For some people, your memories are like a heckler sitting in the back row throwing stones every now and again. Just when you try and step out and to do something. <laughs> and you step back. Just when you're going to try something new, you remember the words that somebody spoke and the feeling that came with that. Oh, yeah. I remember you. I remember. So I'm practicing what I'm preaching. I remember standing in a classroom. It was my first time in that type of classroom. And that's what I mean. There's emotion attached to memories. Right? And I remember going back in there. And that was, a life where, that was a point where my life kind of changed, where I thought I was dumb. Because actually I couldn't read the blackboard. And I sat at the back room, and I didn't even know I needed glasses. It was a time when I felt, I still remember the, the memory of that. So when I walked into that classroom a little while ago, I sat there, and I thought, I sat in the very seat where I used to sit. I looked at the board, and I thought, yeah, I remember. Memories don't just go away. You've got to allow the Lord to come and touch you in those places of your life. I tried to convince my dad that I was okay over it. He said, I was laughing and crying at the same time. He said, well, obviously you're feeling something about it. Because actually I felt this. My excuse was, well, Dad, I've got a master's degree now. Yeah, but you're still crying over it. <laughs> you're going to need to allow the Lord to come and touch that part of your life because the memory, the spirit attached to it is still there. Hello? Hello? Sometimes when you get to step out and do something, even when you feel like you've got all the confidence in the world. Yeah, there's something in the past, memory picks up that stone and oh, I got you. I'm not that far away. For many people, you've got to get rid of that voice. They don't just go away. It needs Christ to come into that memory and change the narrative. See, the thing is, when you, you can't change the facts, None of us can change the facts of what happened or what didn't happen, what we did, what we didn't do. None of us can change those facts. But when we repent and we allow Christ to come in to touch our heart and allow Christ to come into that situation, so there's no time in the spirit realm, but when we allow Christ to come in to touch that part, the facts never change, but the meaning and the significance changes. Now, the, you know, what Joseph said to his brothers, he said, you meant it to harm me, but God meant it to good. The meaning changed when repentance or when the heart was changed. Can't change the facts if you didn't do well at school, but you can change the meaning of it. Your family might have a story of bad memories. You may think about your own family and you think, actually, my life story has been just bad memories. Dad wasn't there, mum was there. Dad was abusive. We didn't have anything. You can live in that story and keep perpetuating that story. 
or you can start to set a new narrative. My dad sent a new narrative in our family. One of the things that we can do, instead of dwelling on old memories, start to create new ones. You can let that narrative remain the same, or you can make a decision to say, I'm going to change the narrative in our family. I am going to, where there's been poverty in our family, I'm going to change the story and that my family will be blessed financially. When there's been a story of pain and abuse, I'm going to change the narrative where my kids are emotionally healthy, where my kids are free from addiction, where my kids love me, my grandkids love me. So how do you create new memories? One, we, first you've got to allow the Lord to heal what's going on in your heart in the first place. But memory strength is formed by discipline. It is a choice to keep going over it, for either good or bad. That's why the, in the Bible there's memory, there's a memorial stones. Lord's, people set up memorial stones. Why? So that we're reminded of the victory, they're reminded of the testimony of God. That's why the Jewish people have feast, feasts or festivals through the year. That's why, to remind them that the Lord is good. It reminds them of where we came from, lest we forget what God has done in our life and where we are going to. There are some things, it's a discipline to do it. Like I said, preached a little while ago, even when London was being bombed, people still had the discipline to go to the synagogue and honour the Lord in the way that they knew how. Why? Because it was discipline. If they knew that they forgot that, the story would change. Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me. So whenever we take communion, it's remembering. It's a, it, it's a, there's an emotion attached to it. There's, a, there's an action attached to it. We do it regularly. Why? Least we forget. It builds memory inside of our life. And your family, when you do things time and time again, even when it's inconvenient, what it does, it builds experience. When you discipline your time, when you discipline your affections, when you don't feel like it, when your emotions are up and when you're down, whatever, regardless, that's what discipline is. It's learning to take dominion over time, learning to take dominion over what's going on inside of you. And in doing so, you can set a new narrative. You look at some people, they were a little bit overweight, but they set, an, uh, set themselves to discipline to become healthy. Now they've set a new narrative inside of their life. We can do that same as a church. We can do that also in our finances. We can do that in our soul. We can do that in our relationships. When my dad came from a father that was emotionally disconnected from the war, instead of having that cycle of pain, he disciplined himself to set a new narrative in our family. So there were times, that every time there were, even though dad was busy, he set a narrative, he set a disciplined time to spend time with us, even if it was only five minutes. That is why we are blessed today. He spent time working in his own heart. Why? Bring healing into the heart, but setting a new narrative. That is why we are here today. Because somebody formed new memories. When I look back, I remember, I remember Bruce. I remember Bruce giving time for my life. I remember it as clear as daylight. I remember people in the church, sure they've made some mistakes or done whatever, or maybe it's some fallouts, but what I choose to remember is what they've done in my life. I forget the mistakes. Communion reminds us of the forgiveness of sin. Miracles remind us of Christ's resurrection. Tithing and offering, when we give our tithes, when I give my offering, it's not because I have to. It's because it's, I don't want to ever forget who my provider is. That is why. I said it as a daily habit or a weekly habit. Or, that's why I do it. Because I love the Lord and I don't ever want to forget that He is the source of my provision. Least I discover it in my own strength. Here's a funny one. And actually, like I said, whenever there's a memory, there's an emotion, and there's an action attached to it. There's a couple more. One was, uh, 
I avoid wasps. The action is I avoid wasps. When I see a wasp, man, there are some swatting and some swiping going on. You tell Kate I knocked her off the seat one day. There's a the memory was, wasn't even my own memory, it was somebody else's memory in my family. They got stung and somehow that memory got passed down to me and all of a sudden, I don't even know why I'm scared of flipping things. But nonetheless, it still affects my life. Here's another one, a little bit closer. One of the actions I've noticed myself doing over years was avoid conflict. The memory behind that, because I remember the pain of conflicting situations and that I came away hurt. So one, I can either choose to keep on avoiding conflict or I can allow the Lord to cut, touch my heart, bring healing into that and then start to embrace conflict in a different way. Set a new narrative. Here we go, listen. I love people. Why? Because I remember I was first loved by God and that was demonstrated through people. I welcome people because I remember being a stranger. Maybe you remember being a stranger somewhere. I welcome people because I remember what it was like to be like that. I remember what it was like to be completely... Man, I'm the, I'm the white one out. <laughs> I'm, I'm the one that's different. I'm the stranger one here. But somebody welcomed me and made me feel at home. That's why I welcome people of different nationalities and different cultures. Love this church. I serve people. The action is I serve people because I remember people served me even when I didn't deserve it. I tithe because I remember how the Lord has provided. I'm committed to coming here to Bay City, not because I have to preach, because I'm the pastor, but I remember what God has promised. And I remember my assignment. I don't come to church. My decisions in coming to church were never based on if the Spirit led me or not. <laughs> no. <laughs> because I remember what the Scripture says. Don't forsake the gathering together of the saints. I prophesy over people because I remember somebody prophesying over me. And I remember what it made me feel like. I remember what it did in my heart. So I make a decision to have a go on somebody else. Then I get a little wrong, at least if I encourage them a little bit, make them feel special. Because I remember what it was like when somebody prophesied over me and said, uh, Lord's using you. I sow grace because I remember grace was given to me, not just by the Lord, through people. I know people here that have extended me grace, so I'll never forget that. I never forget people giving me a second chance. Made an almighty stuff up when I was younger. Oh, I've made a few of them. Yeah, I've made quite a few. But people have extended me grace. I never forget that. So I extend grace to other people. Extend mercy. So I remember too that I was extended mercy. May I encourage you. There are things that we've got to forget. <laughs> There's things we've got to remember. Maybe for you here, there are some things in your heart that have had a front seat for too long. You need to get them out of the building. There are some things, there's some people here today you've got to write a new narrative in your life. I'm so proud of so many of you who come from broken families but made a decision to discipline yourself and to come to church to let your heart to be changed and setting a new story inside of your life. I believe also here today the Lord's going to bring healing into people's memory. People here that you thought you were dumb people here that maybe have had some learning difficulties maybe somebody told you whatever I believe this morning there are people here 
Lord is going to start to come and He's going to start to tump, come and touch your 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 brain. One of the things I felt in my heart was this, especially for people that have experienced learning difficulties. And I'm not going to pull you out. I'm not going to identify you or anything like that. But I'm going to believe that whatever lie, whatever uh, memory or failure that has been inside of your life would be broken. I'm also going to believe that this, that the Lord would release fresh wisdom and understanding inside of your inside of your inside of your mind where people have struggled to, to learn where people have struggled to comprehend some things i'm going to believe that the this is not just about healing a headache this is about fixing or healing your internal life there are people here today you've had a, a narrative that has been painful make a decision today I'm going to remove, I'm going to change the story out of my life. I'm going to change the story of pain and I'm going to turn it into a story of blessing and prosperity. I'm going to discipline myself to do it. I'm going to bring my life into order. I'm going to create a new narrative. I'm going to start to spend more time with my kids. I'm going to start to come to church on a regular basis. I'm going to start to do and discipline myself in order to create new memories. I'm going to create experiences for people. I'm going to open up my life. I'm going to share the blessing of God over my life. I'm going, to, I'm going to share that with other people and create experiences for them because out of the experience, a memory will be formed. Why don't we just stand to our feet? I wonder what things that you need to forget. I wonder, maybe there are people here today that You've just held on to injustices for too long. Maybe you're here and you're, you've held on. You've just remembered failure. Failure has just taken a front row seat in your life. And you're going to make a decision to say, uh, you're not just going to go to the back of the room. You're going to go out of the building. You're going to go out of my life because I'm a new creation. My mind has been transformed. My heart has been transformed. I believe that I can do all things through Jesus Christ who strengthens me. I'm going to start to set a new narrative. There are people here today. I just want to pray for you. And if you want to come to the front, you come to the front. But if you're feeling that this morning that you want to bring something before the Lord, you say, yeah, Lord, yeah, I, I've had some learning difficulties. I want to, Lord, I need your healing in my, in my, in my mental capacity. For people here today, you've got a holding, holding on to some stuff in your heart that you need to let go of, that you need to change the narrative. As we just worship, just for a couple of minutes, why don't you make a declaration today? Why don't you make a decision and come out of your seat and come to the front? And I'd love to pray for you. Let's just start to worship. Worship him. Here we are standing in your presence. Here we are standing in your presence. She kind of glory come down. She kind of glory come down. Here we are standing in your presence. Here we are standing in your presence. She kind of glory come down. I remember when uh, I, I, I stepped out to try and pray for somebody one day and nothing happened and it got knocked back and inside of my heart I made it, I, I kind of let it get into my heart and then every time I got asked to pray for people something inside of me just wouldn't come forward I'd make every excuse under the sun 
because the memory of disappointment, I thought I'd been dis- I thought I'd mucked up. So I made a decision not to pray for anyone. I avoided it. But I have to keep on stretching out. What things we choose to remember. That's what it means to have childlike faith. Often children don't have the the expensive memory bank of pain that we have. And they just take the Lord at His word. Get out of the boat. (laughs) Father, I pray. Father, for every person here that has responded. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, that you're the God that can restore all things. Lord, that you can restore our heart. Lord, that you can restore our imagination. You can store our mind. I pray right now for every person here that has responded. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would come and that you would touch them in Jesus' name. Lord, for those that have had accidents that have affected their memory capacity, their ability to be able to recall, their ability to be able to remember, I pray, Holy Spirit, right now for your healing power would come inside of their lives in Jesus' name. Touch them, Holy Spirit. Be healed right now in the name of Jesus. Lord, I pray for those that have struggled at school, struggled academically. Lord, I pray right now, Holy Spirit, that you would quicken wisdom and understanding inside of their minds in Jesus' name. Lord, where there's been developmental issues, I pray today, Holy Spirit, that you bring healing into that part of their mind in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray for those that are are carrying the pain of the memories of the past. I pray, Holy Spirit, right now that your presence would come and just bring healing in Jesus' name. Minister to those people. Minister to us, Holy Spirit. Come on, if if you come up to the front, just lift your hands. Holy Spirit, move. Move in this place, Holy Spirit. Move in this place, Holy Spirit.